Getting into college is more complicated than ever before. College costs have more than doubled over the last 10 years, and helping your kids pay for college shouldn't affect your retirement planning. You need a college coach more than ever before. Let's join Jeff Morant, author of How to Pay for College Without Going Broke, and the host of the CollegeFundingCoach.com podcast. Oh, my name is Jeff Moran. I'm a certified college planner with CollegeFundingCoach.com. We've been helping parents and students with college planning since 2004. In this podcast, we will be talking about college loans. We have a special guest today, Elizabeth Tandy Shermer, I believe it's pronounced. Dr. Shermer is an associate professor in history at Loyola University of Chicago. She teaches courses in 20th century United States history with an emphasis on, of, on the fields of capitalism, business, labor, political ideas, and ideologies. She has held research fellowships across the United States and the world, including Cambridge University, Rockefeller a foundation in the Center for Advanced Studies in, in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Shermer, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be able to talk to you, um, especially just a few days after college acceptance uh, day. Um, in my case, at my students, they just registered for um, the fall uh, just a couple weeks ago, as well as the summer. So it's the perfect time to be talking about the question of loans and hopefully getting everyone to lean away from them. Absolutely. And again, with uh, May 1st deadline, everybody is excited and they've got their award letters and, and now the, uh, the bills begin to come in. And, and, and I certainly agree, doctor, that the students, parents, whether it be a Stafford loan, PLUS loan, what have you, and we're going to talk a little bit about those different loans and how you feel about them and, and um, how they fit into the grand scheme of things. But uh, uh, Dr. Shermer's uh, book is entitled Indentured Students. What a perfect title. How government guaranteed loans left generations drowning in college debt. So certainly uh, we're going to want to talk about, about that piece. How did you decide on that title? I actually am so glad you asked because I actually got it from borrowers themselves. And I will say I'm, I I'm still have my student debt. And if people want to hear the story about how I came to this project, it was actually finding the student loan documentation that I signed at 17 years old. Um, so not a legal adult when I was cleaning out my father's house. Um, I talk about in the acknowledgments how I came to the book is that needing um, to provide for his elderly care. He, he passed away in March of um, 2020. Um, so he did live to see the book come out, but it really was this question of me, like so many women confronted with this question of care. How can I keep my job? What project could I do to fulfill my requirements at my work, and there was this student loan documentation just tucked in a box and realizing that, you know, we didn't really have any historical scholarship on something that, something that 45 million people currently owe. Absolutely, and, and I just checked the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government statistic, and may I call you, what, may I call you by your first name? Oh, of course, please call me. Uh, Ellie or yeah. Elizabeth? Oh, call me Ellie. That's my that's my nickname. I like it. Um, a little bit, a little break of that big, you know, professional academic name, Elizabeth Tandy Shermer. And, and by the way, everyone gets the pronunciation wrong. It, it, it's spelled oh. funny. There's no C. There's no I. It confuses folks. <laughs> okay, very good. And and pronounce it again for me. Oh, Shermer. Shermer. Okay, thank you. I apologize. You're absolutely oh. right. Forty five million Americans, and that number we I just looked it up. One point seven trillion dollars of college debt. Do you think it's going to keep continuing, or do you think it might change? I, I, I think, sadly, I think it's going to keep um, continuing because, you know, for me, watching what's, you know, the story of my book, especially when we get after the creation of the first real student loan program, the Guaranteed Student Loan Program, which would be eventually renamed, um, is it's a story of piecemeal changes, patchwork ideas, and, you know, the a re, we have to fundamentally change how we pay for higher education in this country to bring that burden off of students and parents. And let's be honest, 
it's not just parents anymore. We have grandparents also borrowing um, for their grandchildren, aunts and uncles. We need to really understand this. And I think for me, one of the challenges is that there were some interesting ideas that have gone nowhere in Washington. And I have to be honest, indentured students, most people thought this was going to be a book about big, bad bankers and for-profit colleges. Well, bankers actually fought the original loan program, and for-profit colleges weren't eligible with big restrictions until the 70s. It's actually a story of policymakers choosing a financial product as opposed to an investment in this basic need to keep that burden off of young people um, and their families' shoulders. Absolutely. And it's so easy, uh, Ellie, to, to check that box. It's so easy to, oh. they, they think they're going to defer that interest. They think in many, in certain cases, the interest is going to be paid by the federal government while they're in school and six months after. How did it get so easy? Well, and I think, oh my goodness, it got so easy you know, over time, because originally it was, the, the original loan program was incredibly complicated, is what you actually had to do, and so I'm talking about the Guaranteed Student Loan Program, not this one that was tied to the National Defense Education Act in the 50s, but the big one, was what the, they had, what, colleges had to decide who was going to get what kinds of awards, which is very similar to what they do today. Then they would have to sort of try and work with bankers to get these incredibly risky financial products even though they came with this government guarantee. And there was a hesitation on this because at the time, the interest on this, that again, guaranteed repayment from the government wasn't very high. Now in our current, um, in our current climate, so my um, student loans before the moratorium was set were at 3.75%, and that's because I was on an automatic payment plan, so there was a, a small 0.25% reduction. But you have, we have others, um, the, the, the student loan rates have actually fluctuated. Um, they're not like, they're actually not like a mortgage, and so it was this this thing about it, as it became the need to have more and more people borrowing, including parents. Parents are actually not included until decades later in terms of their ability to borrow through the federal program that you want to make it much more easier. And the lenders had a hand in making it, so it's just a simple box. So I didn't actually tick off an electronic box. I actually had to, as I mentioned, actually had to fill out that form, but I was 17 years old. I didn't know, and again, I wasn't actually eligible to have my own checking account at that point in time. Yes, it's incredible, and we teach in our podcast, as well as on our uh, our webinars and, and in collegefundingcoach.com and the podcast section or the events and uh, uh, web webinars section, workshop section. You click on that, and there's a uh, uh, webinar on demand. And one of the things I really emphasize in there, and, and, and Ellie, you can give me your opinion on this, is uh, how many borrowers 60, 50, 60 years or older and yes. how much money they still pay, have to owe and still have to pay. Absolutely. And I think that's so important because we have, I always think it's just so laughable about this idea that it would be paid off in 10 years. And that's part of the, where I, the idea was when people were talking about this is feeling indentured, feeling enslaved by this debt. Mm -hmm. It is actually um, this fact that it was, it's supposed to be that you pay it off, you know, in 10 years. Well, what I have left is actually my undergraduate year, uh, my undergraduate debt. And that mm -hmm. is actually, I finished my undergraduate degree in 2003. So it has not been 10 years for me and it hasn't been 10 years for many people. And for me, one of the most frustrating and alarming things, one of the reasons is we, did, that we didn't have a good history of student debt was because the federal government did not mandate real data be collected on this program until mm -hmm. 2008. Wow. That was, I know, that was mm -hmm. more than 40 years after that guaranteed student loan program. So we don't have, we did not have the understanding of the problems of defaults, how long it was taking people to repay, all of this really important things that has shown us a crisis that was always been there. And so where I found that personal pain was the letters of Americans writing in for relief from to their law, to lawmakers or senators or representatives, even the presidents. And it just broke my heart in the early 70s that the mm. Nixon administration just dismissed it as grief mail. But this mm. is the kind of pain of not being able to afford basic needs that we're hearing from borrowers, whether it's a student or a parent or a grandparent today. 
Yes. And I think too, and, and uh, many of our listeners know I'm a financial advisor. I've been doing financial advice since 1980 and college planning since 2004. So I come from a, a financial perspective. And I, I found the statistic in 2018, according to the U.S. Treasury Department, student loans which at that time was a, a trillion five. Now, as I'd mentioned, it's a trillion seven. But in 2018, according to the U.S. Treasury, it represented 45% of the U.S. government's assets as a yeah. balance sheet of, of the assets and liabilities. Um, so that's a great time to ask you, and, and again, you being, uh, being one of our experts, uh, do you think the government can forgive those, these loans that we're hearing all about in the news? Well, to be honest, I'm going to say I would like to, I prefer, I know it's called the Public Sector Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, I actually prefer the, the, the term cancellation because no okay. one did anything wrong for trying to go to college. Good in one. fact, the story that I tell in the book is actually the whole reason that the federal government, starting in the 1930s and the New Deal, started experimenting with tuition assistance was because they recognized the need for the country as a whole to have a more educated population. A lot of it was for their labor market. Is that we need skilled workers. They were already thinking about how are we going to be an arsenal of democracy with the coming of World War II. That was a concern that mm -hmm. we need this. But then they also realized that this is a question of people having a chance to learn more about their country. I realize I'm a little biased as a historian, but but actually, and also, but also the other aspects of this country that need to be explored: its art, its literature, all these things, and that ordinary people clamored for this opportunity. And we benefited from the country as a whole, benefited from a more educated um, population and saying that they need to be forgiven for taking out a debt that was modeled off of, this is the thing, modeled off the federal mortgage program, which we now have the data to show worsens inequality, just like the student loan program does as well. And I think that's so important for us to consider when we use these terms of forgive or cancellation. There's a big legal fight right now about whether or not cancellation is possible. And also it's very clear the Biden administration isn't interested in that kind of large scale cancellation. But my question in this era of inflation, this era of uncertainty coming out of a global pandemic, mm -hmm. There's also a lot of uncertainty with ordinary people owing so much debt for a basic need, not just for them individually, but the country as a whole. Absolutely. Ab and boy, I couldn't agree more. And thank you for the clarification. Cancellation, I'm so used to the forgiveness. Oh, I sir. think I heard I on the yeah. and, and stuff, but cancellation is a perfect, uh, a perfect word. Uh, another statistic I was reading the other day is is seven out of ten graduates have student loans. And again, I, I I'm the here I am as a, a, a college planner and and it, and I really have a passion of helping students um, choose a college, get into college, choose the right major, making sure yeah. the loan is paid off in ten years. One of the pieces we have in our uh, our software, the College Money Report, is a ten year loan payment program, a 20 year, which I just hate getting into those details, but yeah. recognizing a college degree, and here you are with, a, with all your graduate degrees, a college degree is worth easily a million dollars, and I don't think anybody disagrees the value of college or, or comma, trade school, but yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. How, how do we do it the right way, right? Absolutely. And I have to say, I really appreciate that you said about urging your clients to think about paying off sooner because, you know, I mentioned when we were talking before about this whole thing was modeled off the federal mortgage program. And the whole way of doing it was like, instead of investing in the infrastructure for higher education in the 60s, we're going to take this mortgage program, which was also a way of avoiding a real investment in the housing that people need. That's what it was. It was a way of pushing that off and using a financial product where the government guarantee was for the banker, was the, for the banker um, who would actually extend the mortgage, not that you would get a home, 
And it was a guarantee for the banker who would extend the student loan that they would get repayment, not that a student would be accepted, not that they would have the support from the college um, to finish, not that the college would get the finances needed to actually adequately support students and all the other aspects of it, and that's so important. But one of the key differences between the federal and the federal loan and the mortgage program was that when, when um, someone takes out a federal mortgage, they are taking out the entirety of the interest paid as well. The interest locks it. That's not the case in the student loan, oh. right? Is that your? Is that because you take out, but the interest doesn't start accruing until after, as you mentioned, after graduation. Right. On most of them, there's some there's some different right. ones, but right. that is so important because that's why it's important to pay it off sooner rather than later. And there's these folks who think about this question of good debt and all this stuff is like, but you pay because that interest is accruing. And at this point, yeah, it's it's a, a less of an interest than on credit card debt, but actually some of these interest rates, um, and you would know better than I, I'm just sort of focused on what mine was, 4% for my undergraduate, but 6.8%, I had to take out two during graduate school, my computer died in the middle of the term, and I just had to quickly get the money, because you have to have a computer now. Yes, um, yes. And, and so all of a sudden I had this, and I couldn't consolidate them, because if I had consolidated them, it would kick up my undergraduate loan interest rate. Yes, very good, that's very yeah. good. And here you are, and thank you, Ellie, for sharing your personal story. And, and the and here you are, successful uh, as a professor, and 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 you're and you're looking back on your loans and what it represented as far as your college. And again, for our listeners, the average college debt um, is in the thirty forty thousand dollar range. Uh, the word, the rule of thumb we've used for years is think of it, uh, listeners, as for every $10,000 of loans, and that give or take the interest rate, but for every $10,000 of loans, it represents $100 a month of, uh, of, of payments. Holy cow, can you imagine adding yeah. another three, four, five hundred dollars $500 a month on top, and you might only be making 30, 40, 50, only yeah. 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars in that given year, and, and having such a huge percentage. Um, and again, I, I asked you that before. Do you th do you think loans will continue to be so easy to get with these guarantees? I do think so because it's so baked into the system, and I have not seen with the current administration or the one before any interest in really breaking off. I know there is talk about increasing the amount of money for the Pell Grant, but until we see this actual investment from local, state, federal governments in actually supplying the money for these institutions for which they do, the way that I think about it is we have the pandemic revealed how important higher education has become to American life because mm. yes we, are, we do educate absolutely I'm, I'm very proud of my students and I, I, I feel very pr privileged to be in a classroom with them and I'm so hopeful to be on their on their way but then also in terms of the research these vaccines, we needed the scientists for these vaccines. We needed the social scientists and actually to, to learn how to roll them out. And also we needed the arts and humanities to keep us sane, but also to give us the critical reading and thinking skills to make the sense of all these directives that we were given. And that is just so fundamentally important. The pandemic showed that. So why are we putting the burden on that? primarily on students and parents. We're trying to hope that donors will come through and actually put the money in for the vital services. And it's just not right. And for me, one of the things that was tragic about the Build Back Better initiative mm -hmm. had two free years of community college, which is something that was talked about 75 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and actually making these. And I think that that would have been incredible because two free years of community college had the potential of having the cost of community uh, to having the cost of the, the total education pa package. Mm -hmm. I think community colleges do incredible things um, and have incredible services. And then also, I think for me, is that it would have brought that competition in regards to the price. And that would have been really interesting to see to happen. And it was just heartbreaking that that, just was abandoned when it could have done something. And there's a part of me, the way that they were going to try and do this, they weren't mandating, they were letting, they were working, they're going to do a partnership with states. You know, we had two, two of the states that were experimenting with free community college with some federal support starting at the end of the Obama administration were Tennessee and Oregon. Mm -hmm. Look, 
if it can happen in those two states, imagine the interest in this. This could have made a real difference for Americans across the country. Absolutely. And there's no doubt the value of education. There's no doubt the, the value of, a, of, of um, setting goals and finishing what you, what you start and all of those things, certainly that my father and my, my mother taught me. And, uh, and, and things have changed. Things have changed. So different kinds of loans, federal direct uh, Stafford student loans, federal direct plus loans, and the plus is the parents uh, yeah. loan for undergraduate, uh, and then private student loans. So what are your thoughts and feelings on the uh, Stafford loans? And then we'll talk a little bit about the details. So my feeling about it is when I talk to students, um, and I appreciate actually your, your, your um, vantage point on this too with your expertise, is above all else, I want them to avoid the private loans. And uh -huh. the reason is because they do not, they do not come with, the, with the, the protections that there are there. One example is that in the moratorium that we are in right now, those private loans are still being collected. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And I do know that there's horrendous problems problems with the servicers. Don't even get me started on Fed loan because I'm in the public sector loan forgiveness program, and they lost my first two years of payments. They don't really expect someone to have records for 12 years of payments, but they've never met me, and I actually do. Um, but for me, the the federal <clears throat> Stafford loans, what is better about that there are protections for borrowers, the interest question – this is important. I like them. I pref I hate the idea of saddling a young person with debt at all, or a lot of families, because we have we have so we are paying out of pocket in this country for so many basic needs, like our health care, you know, and food costs are going up and stuff like that. But what is a little alarming sometimes about you no, know, in, in a lot is about the about the plus loans, the federal plus loans, is though they actually have um, some of the protections and guarantees, sometimes it's actually sitting with a college advisor such as yourself and thinking, what actually makes better sense in terms of getting the education that I need, that I would benefit? Does it actually need to be that out-of-state private school? Because there's all sorts of other calculations you have to make in terms of actually going to college, right? The transportation <laughs> there and all these other kinds of things. But I think that that's where a more focused discussion of borrowing through the student program, which has important limits on it, making choices for that, and especially to protect, you need to protect the parents' um, savings as well, because they're going to need that, as I know, for their for their elderly years, because it will yes. then become a burden back on the on the student. And I, I think it's just this real holistic thing that we have to, to think about um, in total. Absolutely. Very, very true. Uh, we, uh, one of our taglines is how to pick and pay for college and still retire. Uh, you're yes. absolutely right. Again, we love our children very much. Uh, we want the best for them. We absolutely do. Uh, and, and it, again, they're subsidized, need-based. They're unsubsidized, non-need-based. Uh, interest rates are currently running at last time I looked 3.73% for the Stafford loan. Again, what always amazes me, Ellie, and we'll talk about the, the plus loan in just a second, is the origination fees are almost oh my 2%. God. Uh, For yeah. me, this is, this, one of the tragedies of this story was that, you know, again, it's about trying to avoid the federal government directly paying for this need and passing the costs off through co very complicated financial products onto young people and then now their parents and their and their elderly relatives. Right. And one of the things that was on the table in the 70s was having the IRS deal with these payments. Why is the education department basically running like a bank? Can we yeah. ask that question? Uh, yeah. And, and I, I think this is very important um, to ask. But when it was, there was this moment in the early 90s, it was a big push for the Clinton administration to try and get the IRS to collect these. It would have been so, so helpful in terms of figuring out who actually had the income and what they could actually pay off. So actually getting us close to some of the other foreign loan programs we have, like the Australian model, and it just became this partisan nightmare. But it actually, if you think about having the IRS do it, or the Treasury, 
whatever, that would cut into those loan origination fees because this original guaranteed student loan program I'm talking about, the one that's brokered through banks, all this complicated stuff, not coming directly, the direct loans that we're talking about now, right, right. the way one of the things that happened was when they replaced that in 2010 in the, in the, in the legislation that made it possible for us to also have Obamacare, when mm-hmm. they did that, the, 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 the financial institutions that had grown fat on the original guaranteed student loan program, they became mm-hmm. servicers, and it has been rife with corruption ever since. Very much so. And here we talk about the origination fees on the Stafford loans, the the PLUS loans, the Federal Direct Non-Need-Based Parents Loan. Last time I looked, the origination fees were running around four and three quarters percent. Always in the tiniest of print. The tiniest of print that no one reads. And thankfully, they have a financial advisor like you to do it. And by the way, I want to sneak in something there since we're sort of transitioning to the the parents and this question about you should be able to pay for college but also retire. One thing that I think we need to confront in the 21st century, because remember, this is a a a mid-20th century idea, actually, is this idea that we might need to go back to college in different phases of our lives. And this was particularly true in the 70s when many people find themselves out of work in manufacturing jobs. I live now in Chicago, particularly here in Chicago. And we have to think about um, these financial decisions that are being made for someone to try and stay in the labor market right? To get these new training conditions. Maybe they will be going back to a vocational school. Maybe they will be trying for this four-year degree at different points in their life. Maybe they will have their children first and then go back. We don't know, but I think that some of this is we have to think about the financial options, but I also think that you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't shy away in the book. It is true. It's a, it's a, it's a story of lawmakers not doing the right thing, but it's a, it's a story of academics also fighting it. And mm-hmm. I think that universities, college universities with this direct funding, there should be more to make sure that they are genuinely accessible, not just to young people, right, but to a wider range. And that's one of the reasons why for-profit colleges seem more appealing, because yeah. nonprofit institutions, public or private, have not done enough to make themselves genuinely accessible for 21st century needs. Couldn't agree more. And again, here to put a, a, put a finer point, uh, the Stafford loans uh, are running now at Last time I looked, 3.73%. The plus loans are running at uh, 6.28%. And again, with rising interest rates uh, going up like they are, I think that uh, we're going to see that increase. Uh, Ellie, this has been uh, been wonderful. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for serving these students, uh, your students. Um, it, 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 I can hear your passion, and I think that's neat. Um, the, By the uh, end of the semester, they actually care about financial products that we all oh. take for granted. <laughs> so, Ellie, uh, we've been speaking with uh, the author of Endangered, Endangered Students, How Government Guaranteed Loans Left Generations Drowning in College Debt. It's available at uh, online and certainly on uh, Amazon.com. And um, we really want to uh, thank you for being our guest on, uh, on this, this podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, best of luck to you. We hope you've enjoyed the CollegeFundingCoach.com podcast with Jeff Moran. Please visit our website, CollegeFundingCoach.com. Click on the Events tab for our upcoming workshops and click on Schedule Meeting. We would be happy to visit with you. For over 40 years, our goal is to help you reach yours.